it's really a pleasure for me to introduce Rachel Kadish. You know, I have to say, we arrange these things, I don't know, eight, nine months in advance, and there's an exchange of, I sometimes actually go back and look at the number of emails that have been exchanged, but it was an awful lot, and then to finally have her here this evening is kind of the culmination and yet a beginning of something. So let me tell you about her. She is a novelist whose writings include From a Sealed Room and Tolstoy Lied, A Love Story. She has also written a novella entitled I Was Here. Her work has appeared on NPR and the New York Times and has been anthologized in the Pushcart Prize Anthology. By the way, the Pushcart Prize is a way of honoring um, publishing houses which are not the largest houses, but it's a way of showing honor to great authors. She has been a fiction fellow of the National Endowment for the Arts, as well as the Massachusetts Cultural Council, and was the Corette Writer in Residence at Stanford University. Rachel has received the Association of Jewish Libraries Fiction Award and the John Gardner Fiction Award. Her most recent work, The Weight of Ink, won the prestigious National Jewish Book Award. I'll share with you just two comments, one about her and one about the book. Toni Morrison said, a gifted writer, astonishingly adept at nuance, narration, and the politics of persuasion. And Carol Gilligan wrote, the weight of ink is astonishing. That is high praise from two rather significant thinkers. You can purchase the book after the program, and I know she will happily sign it. Please join me in welcoming Rachel Kadish. Now, I also meant to introduce Rabbi Yoshi Zweibach first, and I forgot to do that, which means I may not be, have a job tomorrow morning, but the one thing I will say, all of us who work with Rabbi Zweibach and all of you who are part of this congregation know one thing. Every day this congregation gets better and better and higher and higher, and that is in good part due to working with you, Rabbi Zweibach. So thank you, and enjoy the evening. Thank you, Rabbi Wozniaka, and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I know that there's a lot of other things you could be doing this evening, but I can't think of anything I'd rather be doing this evening than having the opportunity to listen to Rachel and to reconnect um, and, and to be with you all. So thank you for being here. Um, tell us a little bit about how you started this project, and also maybe you could say a few words about what the book is about, because I know a lot of folks in the room have read The Weight of Inks. Some others might already be in the midst of it, but without giving too many spoilers, maybe you could share a little bit about the, uh, the summary of the book, and maybe even a few passages. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I know, I'm sure everyone has a lot to do on weeknights, um, but I'm delighted to be here, and uh, thank you for giving me an excuse to escape the polar vortex in <laughs> Austin. Um, so I tend to start writing when something is bothering me and I don't quite know what I think about it. There's a quote from Henry James that I love. It's, how do I know what I think until I see what I say? And for me, if something's puzzling me, bothering me, I have to start making up stories in response to it. I have to write something. And then I think, oh, yeah, that's, that's what I think of that. So um, some years ago, I was mulling over this quote from Virginia Woolf that bothered me. And it's in A Room of One's Own. And Woolf asks the question, what if William Shakespeare had had an equally talented sister? What would have been the fate of that woman, you know, a woman with that kind of capacious mind? And Wolf answers her own question, and her answer is, um, quote, she died young. Alas, she never wrote a word. Now, you can't argue that that is the most likely fate for a woman with talent in that era, not necessarily a literal Shakespeare sister, but a woman who had something to offer, a symphony in, to, in her to compose, a painting to paint. Um, the most likely fate is to die without doing it because of the restrictions on women's lives and educations and domestic labor and all of this. Um, but I couldn't help shadow boxing with it. I couldn't help thinking, what if, what if, what, what would it take for a woman not to die without writing a word? I thought, well, for one thing, she would have to be a genius at breaking rules, and that's cool, that's fun. That's fun writing about rule-breaking characters. Um, and um, so I, I started thinking about this idea of, um, I wanted to write a novel that would reach back in time to ask this question of what would it take for a woman um, not to be silenced when everything around her is telling her to sit down and mind her manners. 
Um, and I started looking for a historical time period, and I, I needed a time period that would just feel right. And I also needed a kind of frontier scenario, because that's when they let women have access to something that women aren't usually given access to. So like the Rosie the Riveter, Riveter kind of scenario. Um, okay, we don't have any guys here right now who can do this, so you can do it for now, honey, till the right guy shows up, and, and that's it. So I started looking, and I was reading about the um, history of the Jewish community of Amsterdam, 17th century. And um, I had known nothing about the community. I didn't know that uh, the Jews of Amsterdam were not Ashkenazic, they were Sephardic, they were um, refugees from the Spanish and Portuguese Inquisition. I didn't know that Amsterdam was the only place that you could safely be Jewish in Europe at the time. In fact, they called it the New Jerusalem because there were almost no restrictions on what Jews could do. You could not um, discuss atheism, but nobody could. This was a time when people were literally ripped limb from limb for discussing for sounding atheist in Europe, um, you couldn't debate religion with non-Jews. And there were a couple other rules, but that was pretty much it. And um, so it was this haven. Um, another thing I didn't know about this community was that they were the ones who had excommunicated Spinoza. I didn't know Spinoza was Jewish. I'd never taken a philosophy course. I was completely intimidated by, by uh, and, and a little alienated by the topic of philosophy, actually. The language I found very off-putting. Um, but here's the thing. I started reading Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein's book, which is wonderful, called Betraying Spinoza. Um, and I got to the part where they excommunicate Spinoza. I hadn't known that excommunication in that community was not the big scary thing it sounds like. Excommunication was a measure of communal discipline in that community. It was mild. It was, you're excommunicated for two weeks until you say you're sorry and don't do it again, right? That was excommunication until Spinoza. And they gave him this absolute fire and brimstone lifetime ban. Someone actually told me that the, the tradition didn't have the language for it. They went to the Catholic Church to get the language for the fire and brimstone ban. Lifetime ban on Spinoza on anyone who had contact with him. And I read this, and sometimes you read a really old document and you hear the human emotions in it. And I heard the fear, and I thought, these people are terrified. Because here comes Spinoza, they've, they've found this perch of safety, and here comes Spinoza. And he's sounding, frankly, atheist, and he's definitely debating religion with non-Jews. And they're afraid he's going to mess it up for them. And suddenly I thought, I know these people. They're refugees. And I grew up around refugees. My grandparents were Holocaust survivors. My mother was born on the run. And even though this was centuries apart and, and you know, culturally different, um, I recognized something in this beautiful, fierce desire to rebuild, and also the, the brittleness, the sense that anything could mess it up and it could all fall apart again. So I thought, I want to write about these people, this community. And then I heard about this moment when a rabbi from that community approached um, Cromwell to say, let's get the Jews readmitted to England, because there were officially no Jews in England, even though there were tiny hidden communities that masqueraded as, as Catholic there. And so um, they had this sort of Cromwell can't fully get it through Parliament, but they have a semi-readmission of the Jews. And it was a moment where some of the Jews from Amsterdam went to sort of re-educate the Jews of London who did not want to be outed, who did not want to be re-educated. So it was a dicey time, and I thought, that's my frontier. So I thought, okay, I'll have a scenario where there's a blind rabbi <clears throat> who was blinded in the Inquisition. And um, <clears throat> I, just, I made him blind because there needed to be a reason. He needed a scribe. And I thought, he'll go to London to help re-educate this Jewish community, and he'll have maybe a housekeeper, and he'll have a pair of orphans in his home, brother and sister, um, for reasons I won't go into, because spoilers, the brother can't scribe, so the, the, do the, the, the girl, the sister, will become his scribe. And that will be the way I have a 17th century woman character who suddenly has access to books, to writing instruments, and time to write um, that would not otherwise be given to a woman. And I started writing... Um, just with a voice, and I'll actually read a little bit because th this astonishes me that it was the first thing I wrote, and the first thing I write, the first 20 things I write, I always have to cut. Uh, they're usually complete junk, and, and it's like, but you have to put up the scaffolding, and then you build the building, and then you have to take away the scaffolding, otherwise you can't see the building, so that's usually what the first paragraphs are, but this stayed, and it's the prologue of the book. It's just a couple paragraphs, um, and maybe it'll, it'll give a sense of the, the voice. Um, so I started writing. I don't outline in advance. I'm happy to, if anyone is interested in discussing why, I'm happy to talk about why I don't and I can't. Um, but um, so I just started with this voice. I knew the character had something to confess, and I didn't know what. June 8th, 1691, 11th Sivan of the Hebrew year 5451, 
Richmond, Surrey. Let me begin afresh, perhaps this time to tell the truth. For in the biting hush of ink on paper, where truth ought raise its head and speak without fear, I have long lied. I have not to defend my actions, yet though my heart feels no remorse, my deeds would confess themselves to paper now as the least of tributes to him whom I once betrayed. In this silenced house, quill and ink do not resist the press of my hand, and paper does not flinch. Let these pages compass at last the truth, though none read them. So I wrote that, and I thought, okay, that's going to be my main character. I named her Esther, because that was the most common name for uh, daughters in, of the um, Spanish and Portuguese Inquisition. It was, you know, Esther had to hide her Judaism, and then she saved her people. This was the most common name they gave to their daughters. And um, Esther Velasquez grew up in the same community as Spinoza. And then she goes to London, and, and she gets access to books and learning. And the more she reads, the more she finds there are questions she is desperate to ask and to discuss with others, but questions that, it, that were quite dangerous to ask, um, and that would bring down danger on her and on her household if anyone knew what she was writing and to whom she was addressing her letters. Um, so that was Esther. And then, but if, and for those who have read the book, um, you know, if you turn to the next page, chapter one. Um, the book starts in contemporary London, so it's 350 years later. Esther Velasquez's writings and, and her voice have long since been lost. Um, and uh, we start with Helen Watt, who is a British non-Jewish uh, professor of history. Um, she's only uh, in her early 60s, but she's in ill health, and she has, among other things, a, a hand tremor. Um, which means she should not be handling delicate papers. Um, and she has just gotten a phone call from a former student of hers who she doesn't even remember, Ian Easton. And Ian, and, uh, Ian calls her up and says, basically, my wife uh, and I have been turning this old house that was in the wife's family into uh, an art gallery. It was a 17th century, century house. We're renovating it. We had the electrician come to put in wiring. He opened up the old carved staircase to put wiring up. And as he opened up the old carved staircase, he found these shelves crammed with documents. They're really old. Uh, I don't know if it's Hebrew or not, but there's something that's signed with the name of a rabbi in, in, uh, it's in, in Portuguese, although he doesn't know that. Um, and he basically says, you know something about Jewish history, please come, get the papers out so we can finish our renovation. And she goes out there not thinking that the papers will have any value or that they're even going to be 17th century, although the house is 17th century. Um, and it's Helen, uh, with the help of a, a graduate student named Aaron Levy, who will begin to examine and discover the papers that Esther Velasquez left behind. And I think maybe the, the last thing I'll do before we really jump into the rest of conversation is um, just read a couple paragraphs of Helen, just to, again to give a sense of her world and her voice. So um, this is just the moment when Helen first sees the, the papers. There on a small card table beside the window was a single cracked leather bound volume Beside it lay the two pages Ian had told her about over the phone, the first items his electrician had removed from under the staircase upon discovering the documents. For an instant, she allowed herself to stare at the pages, taking in the thick textured paper she dared not touch. Then, at the counterpoint of two alphabets on the page, the Portuguese lettering that led from left to right, interrupted by scattered Hebrew phrases that ran in the reverse direction. Slowly, she read and reread. Ian's voice coming from just behind her. Over there, he said, and pointed. She lifted her eyes. There, in a dim corner at the base of the staircase, untouched by the blinding light of the landing's windows, was a small panel that had been forced open. Ignoring Ian's tentative offer of help, Helen approached the opening. Lowering herself slowly to the floor, her cane trembling heavily under her weight, she knelt before it like a penitent. She stayed that way for a long time, her hands pressed to the cool floor, and a great heaviness nearly overcame her, as though all her years had suddenly taken on physical weight. For a long while, she simply stared at the crammed shelves, breathing very quietly. Then finally, knowing she should not, she lifted a quaking hand to remove a single page, a moment only. The page, astonishingly, rested unharmed on her two outspread palms, like a bird that had agreed for just this moment, to alight there. I wrote that, and now I had Helen. I had Esther and I had Helen, and later on I brought in Aaron, who's the other contemporary character. 
And then I just, um, I had this structure that we were going to alternate between past and present and that it would feel like, um, like a mystery because that's, you know, historians are basically detectives trying to put together the story of what happened and what it meant. And so um, I bounced back and forth between past and present and I, I improvised because I had an outline and went from there. So in a moment, I want to ask more about the process, but maybe you could tell us a little bit more about your own journey to writing. Um, you mentioned already that your family had these experiences that helped bring you into this story. You were attracted to the idea of the, you know, the refugee, people on the run, like right. your grandparents and your mom. Um, but tell us about growing up and your Jewish journey and what ultimately led you to wanting to become a writer. Sure. Um, so my mother's family. Alex, can you turn the volume up a little bit, please? Okay. Thank you. That's okay. Let me know if you need me to do once anything. We, once we get it loud, oh. enough, you'll tell us if it's loud enough. Okay. All right. Well, I'll just talk, and you tell me if I need to did do anything the, different. Did you hear the question, Shell? It's fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so my mother's family. Um, uh, my grandparents were from Krakow, uh, and they actually got out of Europe. Through, it, um, I'm just curious. How many people here have heard of Tiuni Sugihara? See, I almost never, okay. Um, they call him the Japanese Schindler. There was a Japanese diplomat, diplomat named, okay, yes. <laughs> so my family had Sugihara visas. So they went out, um, uh, they were on the run for quite a while, and then they ended up in Kovno in Lithuania, and then they went Trans-Siberian Express, fishing boat to Japan, um, got on a Japanese boat that actually first, uh, it was heading to Curacao, first came to California, was kept under spotlight offshore, not allowed in, you know, under searchlight, so no one would swim to shore and went down the coast. And when they docked in Mexico, they bribed the, um, the ship's doctor to quarantine them with diseases they didn't have for treatment on land. So they had to go to shore for treatment and they were hidden by the Mexican Jewish community on rooftops till the ship sailed on. My mother was born in Mexico and then they came here. Um, and most of them moved to Israel eventually. My dad's family story was the but more... If there's, if there's, is this on? Are we good? If there's anyone here from ICE, please just... It was a long time ago. <laughs> they actually... Um, the, I'll tell you something. My grandfather... I said to Rachel, don't get political with this group, <laughs> okay? That's my grandfather my nearly blew the whole thing when they were finally crossing uh, from Mexico into Texas where he made a joke in front of the uh, border agent saying this is the first border we've actually crossed legally. And yeah, but they did cross that one legally. Everything else, they were, they were on the run. Um, and they got thrown in Russian prison for border crossings and things, so. Um, uh, so, and my, my father's family had the more classic American Jewish, you know, came at the turn of the last century and, um, and nobody talked about, about the old country very much. But my grandfather was a storyteller. I grew up on his stories. Um, and I grew up um, wrestling with um, him, having, him telling me that I couldn't trust anyone who wasn't Jewish. And I, as a kid, would, um, would argue mightily, and I'm still arguing mightily, uh, although he's been gone a long time, because I think that it would be uh, foolish in the extreme to ignore his reasons for saying that. Um, and I know he said that out of love and protectiveness for his grandchildren. Uh, for me, I, and I'm happy to talk more about the, the work I'm doing in, in response to this, but my feeling is that we're only safe if we cross, if we trust across these lines. But that's not a passive thing. It's a very, trust has to be a very active thing and working with people on it. And I'm involved in some projects about that uh, right now. But it, my, my fantasy when I was a little kid was, you know, just to go to different places and tell, tell stories and then people would understand each other and, you know, we make things safer and better. So that's, you know, a, a child's version of it. But I think that um, a lot of what drives me as a writer is that. And, and also just, you know, the basic human desire to want to find words for what you see around you. And I would watch my grandfather. I remember he had these hand gestures and I wanted to find words for them. They all meant something different. You know, the, you, you don't want to be on the receiving end of that, right? And then there's that, you know, and then... That, that's when you're taking your grievances elsewhere, so, yeah. Well, what was his name, your grandfather? Emanuel Stein, yeah. Emic. Yeah. He must have uh, spoken a lot of languages with all of those travels. He did, he did. Uh, and um, yes, I grew up around a 
you know, my family, also the European Jewish thing at that time, you know, he spoke 12 languages, my mother spoke eight. I feel very uneducated in comparison. So in terms of your Jewish journey, so one of the things that you shared is, you know, this, um, this piece from your grandfather about not trusting non-Jews and how you tried to understand that and mm -hmm. navigate that. Um, in terms of, um, you know, you went to Camp Ramah mm -hmm. uh, and, and Solomon, Solomon Schechter Sch Day School. Yeah. So um, the texts that you were exposed to are the kinds of texts that you take us through in The Weight of Ink. Does that kind of bring you back to those experiences? Yes, that was definitely my Solomon Schechter education at work. Um, I, I feel like the mic is coming in and out, so let me know if it's a, if it's a problem. Um, uh, yeah, and I had a lot of, I mean, a lot of education, uh, exposure to uh, Jewish education growing up. We weren't particularly religious, but at that point, half of my mother's family had already moved to Israel, so she wanted us to grow up speaking Hebrew. So, um, so we went to religious uh, school. So it, it gave me a map so that when I wanted to research these topics, I knew where to look. Um, I wasn't, you know, I knew, oh, Shabtai Tzvi, I, I have some sense of who that is. I, you know, I knew where to, where to turn to track things down. And I think um, I ended up writing about some issues, even though I was writing about 17th century character during the, the Spanish and Portuguese Inquisitions, um, I ended up, without even realizing it, heading into terrain with the philosophy in the book that really, um, it, it echoed some of the issues that I, as, you know, as a kid growing up around all these Holocaust survivors, you know, that I wrestled with, and I wouldn't have put the word philosophy or theology onto it. These were just the questions that were bugging me. Um, I think for some people, uh, the, the shadow of the Holocaust drives them in the direction of faith, and for some people, it, it, it pushes them away. And for me, I really struggle with, you know, how can you believe in God in the shadow of this? And I think that um, writing about Esther asking some of these questions during the Inquisition ended up being a way of, of voicing some of those debates that I have. Yeah, I was going to ask, you know, her struggle with belief and without giving uh, too much away, you know, in the correspondence that we uh, come to learn that she's having with important thinkers of the day, um, you know, there's that, there's that question. And when you think about your own story of growing up with the, the history that you had in terms of your, especially on your mom's side, but then going to Solomon Schechter and Ramah, but not being observant or, or, you know, what you said is religious, was that something you ever felt you had to hide a little bit? That, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of here for the Hebrew? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I've definitely felt kind of self-conscious um, about being, you know, the only... I don't know if I was the only kid whose family didn't keep kosher. I was the only family who, who would admit... I was the only kid who would admit that her family didn't keep kosher in the school I grew up in. Um, yeah, and I always thought I would describe myself as a bad Jew. Um, and I think what I've come to feel is maybe I'm not such a bad Jew. I love the tradition and the history, uh, you know, with a, a really powerful dedication, but I don't, um, I'm not religiously observant. The language that, um, that you use in the book, in the 17th century passages, I mean, it's so interesting because you know, it's taking place in London, but some of the characters are not native English speakers, and the English that they're speaking is not an English that we could much understand if you actually wrote it as they would have said it. How did you come up with the dialect? Because there's still a feel, as a reader, it, it feels authentic. I never found myself feeling like, why are they talking that way? Or I never found myself coming across something that felt anachronistic. But you had to kind of create a language for that moment. How did you go about doing that? Yeah, that was, a, that was a really big challenge because at first I was just crazy about authenticity. Okay, I need to write exactly the way they write. So I had all these 17th century texts. But the fact is, there's a reason that we don't all sit around reading Samuel Pepys for fun these days. And it's completely salacious stuff, right? If you read Samuel Pepys' diaries, you know, who is doing what behind the curtains? But the problem is that the sentence structure, it's not even the vocabulary, it's a sentence structure. The sentences in the 17th century are these like loop-de-loopy -loop structures. By the time you get to the end of the sentence, so wait, where, where did we start and how do we end up here? From, that's from the modern perspective. And, but I was really struggling. I thought I had to write in those kind of sentences, but I didn't want to. And then I read this wonderful interview, a wonderful interview by David uh, Mitchell. Um, 
where he talked about finding a language for a historical novel, and he referred to it as bygonese. He said, you invent a language, he'll call it bygonese, it has to sound old, it cannot be anachronistic, but it also can't be the way people actually talk, because it'll sound ridiculous. There was a time when people in America said, gadzooks, but if you say that, it just sounds laughable. So you have to find some middle ground, and that freed me up, and what I decided to do was use a modern sentence structure, but make sure that in the 17th century chapters, even if I wasn't writing dialogue, even if I was describing a shoe or something, I couldn't use any word that wasn't in the language at the time. And I hoped that if I made 10,000 tiny word-level choices like that, the texture of the language would feel old without it being an impediment to reading it. So, for example, in the section I just used, uh, let these pages compass the truth. Compass as a verb, that feels old, right? You hear that? It feels old. When I was writing, um, for those who've read the book, when Esther accompanies Mary around London, I thought, oh, I want her to be her chaperone. And, but any word I wasn't sure about, I would go look it up. I know this is really nerdy, but if you look up Merriam-Webster for every single word, that's part of the dictionary listing nobody looks at. At the bottom, it says first known use. So you look down, oh, chaperone, first known use was in the mid-1700s. Can't use that word. So then I had to find out what did they use, and it turns out they would say someone was a companion or a duenna. So in the book, that's what I use. And I, my hope was that if I just was consistent and I kept to my rule, that the, the texture would just feel old. You mentioned uh, a salacious text, and there were some moments with Mary especially mm -hmm. where you know, I found myself wondering, like, how common was this kind of behavior um, women who were not really chaperoned, um, or, uh, or, you know, were Esther as the chaperone, um, behaving in ways that would be problematic from the perspective of the community. Yeah. How did you find out, you know, what those boundaries were? Right. Well, the fun thing about writing fiction is that your job is to be descriptive, how people actually are, as opposed to prescriptive, how people ought to behave. So you can look and you can find out what the rules of a society were, but then if you look at the documents, you'll see, well, and here's what happened when children were born out of wedlock. Here's what, so you can tell that people were doing other things. But it was an interesting moment in 17th century London because um, the, all those years with the Puritans and um, the Cromwell, when bright colors were forbidden, people couldn't wear ribbons, the theater was shut, it was very, everything was very repressed. And then the monarchy comes back and the restoration was wild and it was pretty sexually libertine. And there was, you know, open bisexuality, homosexuality, you know, we think, oh, 17th century, they, you know, it was not all so shut down, but that was in the mainstream society, but the Jewish community was still quite traditional. And so you're, you have these characters living in tension, and then you have adolescents acting out as adolescents do, but then you have these moments where society cracks open and the plague was starting, and that's when things get crazy. Anytime the, the normal rules are lifted because there's some crisis going on, um, that's when wild things happen. So I, I took liberties with the characters in there, but I, I felt like I didn't do anything I didn't think was plausible. So one of the um, big ideas of the book, or one of the, the main themes is, you've already talked about, is you know, how, how is it that Esther as a woman can um, make her voice heard, but there's something sort of inherently sinful in the, you know, in the, in the context in which she finds herself about what she's doing. There's, there's a deception that has to mm -hmm. take place for her to be able to do it. And a relationship that really matters to her, the relationship with the rabbi, has to be undermined and betrayed in certain ways. What are you saying about writing? Um, you know, this is your chosen profession or the profession that chose you. We can talk more about that later, yeah. too. Um, are, you, are you telling us something about writing itself, or is it something that we shouldn't generalize from? Um, that's an interesting question. I don't think I'm talking about writing per se, although I'll get back to that in a moment. But, um, but maybe it is a commentary on honesty, because I think each of us in our own way, in our lives, um, we hit these moments where we have to ask, at what price honesty? At what price, you know, if I say what I see, will it blow everything open? We've, I've had that, you know, you think about that in human relationships, in friendships, in the workplace, and, you know, if I say what I think is true, um, what do I risk for myself? Do I give up my own, um, my own place in the world I'm in? 
uh, what kind of, there are all kinds of orthodoxies of thought that we grow up in. And if you say, wait a second, you know, that's not true, or I don't agree with that. Are you going to hurt people? Will you no longer be welcome? That can happen one-on-one -on -one in relationships. It can happen communally. Um, and I think the, the biggest, uh, the painful struggle for the character Esther, and what was painful for me in writing her story, and I'm, I won't say too much because of spoilers, but that the person who was there for her the most, the rabbi, is someone who, um, you know, she feels that what she's doing is not just the, the literal betrayal of, of, you know, he's blind and he can't see what she's writing, but that her very thinking, um, the direction her thoughts take her in um, about questioning the need for martyrdom and all that. This is a man who lost his sight in the Inquisition, under the Inquisitors. He gave that up for his faith. And if she's saying that that isn't real, then what is she saying to this person she loves? Um, so there's, there's that, and I think it, for each of us, there's, you know, how much of the truth do you tell and what, do you hurt people by telling the truth? The thing I said, I'd come back to being a writer, I think that um, for me writing is about truth telling, which may sound odd because I'm a fiction writer. So what's fiction? It's a pack of lies. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> None of this is real. Um, but you know, all the historical bits are real, but not the characters. Um, but for me, it's a way to tell the truth because I think one of the things art does is it tells the human truth, which is all the layers deep of, of what it's like to be a human being, not just the top social, socially polite layer. So when I teach writing to little kids, which sometimes I do, I say to them, um, okay, so your best friend just got a present, and it was something you really wanted. What do you say? And any kid who's over the age of three or four knows what they're supposed to say. It's, That's great. I'm so happy for you. Right? So, okay. Underneath that, what are you thinking? And they say, I wanted that. Okay, underneath that, what are you thinking? Why'd they give that to her and not me? Do they like her more than they like me? Okay, what are you thinking under that? Do they like her more than me because of that time when whatever? And it just goes on and on. And that's, you know, what Tolstoy is doing when you read Tolstoy, he's going all those layers deep into human experience, not just the polite social level. And I think, you know, if I, for me, if I were to write memoir, I'd, I'd be protecting somebody, I'd be protecting other people's privacy. Not that people in my life have deep, dark secrets, but it's their privacy, not mine. And if I thought I was going to write a tell-all about my own life, well, um, probably I can't see my own flaws, right? You can see my flaws, because you're not me, but I can't see them. So, okay, so that's not the best way for me to tell all the truths, and then if I were to try to write biography, how do I really know what it's like to be someone else? But if I write fiction, then I can go all those layers deep. I don't have to worry about protecting anybody. Nobody's going to sue me. Um, so, uh, so anyway, just to, so that I think that writing can be explosive because you are saying all those things that we don't want to say in polite society. Um, you talk about saying the truth. So I want to read a passage, um, and I want, if you're willing to, to uh, have you respond to it and tell us if it's, if it's your truth or if it's um, just a layer of the story. So um, one of the characters in the story, Marissa, is talking to Aaron Levy, um, and this is in the present day section of the story, and she describes um, us, uh, American Jews. And she writes, she says, um, or maybe you had her say this, right? This didn't actually happen. Now I'm all confused about what just happened. There's, there's right. nothing that's... Okay, it's fiction, it. fiction, exactly. Yeah, it's okay. all fiction. You have Marissa say to Aaron, American Jews are naive. They don't want memory or history that might make them uncomfortable. They just want to be liked. Being liked is their sugar rush. Now, first of all, what's wrong with wanting to be liked? I mean, it was, you know. <laughs> they were going to say, what's wrong with yeah. sugar? Yeah, yeah, what's wrong with sugar? Um, do you agree with what you had Marissa say to Aaron? Um, and, and, and sort of maybe when did you agree with that? Or yeah. in what settings do you find yourself thinking that? Yeah. Um, yes, and. So one of the things that is fun for me about writing fiction is that if there's an issue that I feel torn about, I can give... I can give it to two characters to argue out, and I can be like, yeah, what she said, yeah, what he said. I can sort of walk all the way around it. But um, look, I grew up with my grandfather's stories. I grew up with relatives who had been in Russian prisons. I, get, you know, um, I had family lived in Israel, and there was something that, that did feel naive to me growing up. There, there was something that felt very innocent, sometimes not in, in good ways, about the whole, you know, 
it couldn't happen here. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, there are things about, I, I am very much an American Jew, and I, I um, there are things about, um, sorry, my voice is going, <clears throat> about the, uh, the pluralism here, and things about the openness and the, the ethics, you know, here that I love. And my Israeli family come over for um, Simchas now, and they're like, wow, we really like how you guys do things. So, um, so I'm kind of a, a child of, of both wor worlds. But there's something that, um, that has made me uncomfortable in the past about um, one stream of American Jewish self-representation, -re um, the whole uh, neurotic joke. It bothers me. Uh, oh, Jews, we're so neurotic. Well, yeah, you know, some of us are neurotic and some of us aren't, but that, that as a, a group, we're neurotic. And the, the, um, it, it almost feels like a bit of a soft shoe routine. Um, you know. Don't hate us. All our fears, they're just neuroses. I don't think it's neurotic to think that there are people in the world who want to kill Jews because they're Jews. I grew up very much knowing that's not neurotic. And so the, the neurotic jokes used to bother me, um, that kind of self-deprecating humor. Um, and um, so that's a, a, a way I, I never felt totally aligned with um, American Jewish self-representation. Uh, you have two children. Yes. And um, we talked a little bit about this earlier. You know, how has the work that you've done as a writer and someone who's taught writing, um, how, how has that shaped you as a parent, do you think? What, what are some of the things that maybe writing has taught you about being a mom? Um, I think that, uh, well, you know, the, the obvious one is patience. Patience, patience, patience. Um, and, uh, you know, so much attention to detail, but that everything takes longer and is more work than you think it's going to, and that's okay. All the most worth worthwhile things are, and you jump in, you make a full commitment, and you just do it. Um, and um, to try to, I mean, I think, I, 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 this maybe gets into a little bit about um, something I was saying earlier when we were speaking about, you know, characters and just kind of following rather than trying to control them or determine what they do. There's, there's, you know, the kids, it's just, you know, let them be who they are and discover it and delight in discovering it. And that's something I do on the page, and so it's good practice for when I had, you know, kids of my own. And in the other direction, being a parent has taught me so much that I've taken into writing. Um, and not just all the, you know, life lessons and all of that, but um, I spent a lot of time reading um, books for young readers with my kids and young adult fiction. And the one thing that is true with middle grade and young adult fiction is it can't be boring. It's got to have a plot. You can't just have these long meditative passages that go nowhere. And, um, you know, having gone to grad school and I, I studied a lot of writing that it was a sort of genre that it, it, um, it didn't necessarily have to have a lot of plot. And I think that, um, I like to think that I, I remembered the importance of a good plot because of all the time I spent reading those books with my kids. So, you know, when you went to your publisher and you said, yeah, I have a 500 page historical fiction novel. It's set in London. It includes references to Spinoza <laughs> and uh, many uh, much less well known philosophers uh, of the day. Every now and then, you know, there might be a little bit of a Shakespeare um, reference coming in. Um, but, uh, and you know, there's going to be um, Portuguese and Hebrew Aramaic passages, um, but I really think this thing's going to go. Um, <laughs> That's exactly how the conference. Right. What, um, and yet it's, it's a Jewish Book Award winner. Um, it's sold over 100,000 copies, and hopefully tonight, you know, we'll sell, you know, a couple hundred more. Um, what what do you think made them take this enormous um, you know embrace this great opportunity on the one hand, but also you know kind of a risk? I am very lucky in my agent and in my editor, and I uh, did not want to tell my agent how long the book was for a really long time. Um, and uh, we at one point she wanted to you know you see the early pages, and I showed her it was about 180 pages. And, I was like, and she heard 140 characters? I yeah, can yeah, sell that. That yeah. works. And right. I said, it's, it's, about, it's about half the book. <laughs> I didn't know how long it was going to be at that point. But, and, and I should say, these are manuscript pages. So a 550-page book, this is a 700-page manuscript, which was initially longer. And I cut it. This is the, 
this is the condensed version. <laughs> but um, my agent was great. She said, um, when I started talking about what I was doing, she said, um, she said, it's a big book and it's allowed to be a big book. It just can't be any longer than it has to be. Like every word, you have to make every word count um, when you're asking readers to take on that much. And I tried to do that and I you know, trimmed things down as much as I could. Um, There's a lot of history and I had to find the most um, condensed ways I could to tell that history and to also make you feel like you, not make you feel like you were going to a lecture, but make you feel like the, the way we learn family stories when we're kids. You're at the, the table and conversation whizzes past you and at some point you know that, you know, Uncle Joe had a prior wife that nobody talks about and all the old family stories without anyone sitting you down and telling you because you've picked up on all the references. So that's what I tried to do, to just have the history fly by you enough so you eventually knew it. Um, but um, they were great and, um, and Houghton Mifflin really took a leap because in the age of Twitter, are people going to have the attention span to read a longer book? But, um, but it turns out that there's room in the world for an immersive reading experience and I'm, I'm grateful that other people feel that way. So earlier I read the passage um, with Aaron and Marissa that was a bit of a commentary on America. Um, there's a passage about Israel that I thought was interesting, but it's not just about Israel, it's also about, also about America. But I wanted to read it, and um, I know you've spent a lot of time in Israel, you have family there, you're a Hebrew speaker, you've been there with, with your kids. Um, so this is the passage. It's a serious thing. I'll probably be the most left-wing person in all of Israel but at least I'll be arguing with people who deal with reality instead of living in a bubble. So that says something about Israelis, but it also says something about Americans, diaspora Jews. What are you saying about Israelis there? Um, and that's Marissa speaking. It's the same character as before. And that's where she takes it a step further, I think, further than, than I would. But I do think that you know, Israelis are, are right up you know, against very stark realities. Uh, you know, life and death realities that Americans in general have not faced in their home towns. Um, and um, certainly American Jews. And so I think that's the case. I don't think that, um, you know, you can say American Jews have lived in a bubble, well, a more, more protected, safer space, but also that safer space has allowed for a flowering of some things that don't have room to flower when you're under constant daily pressure. So um, I see both sides and the beauty of both cultures very much, and that's, you know, my family is on both sides of that. Do you find yourself feeling a little bit, uh, the Hebrew expression is navanad, um, you know, a wanderer, um, because you know, you're not entirely at home here, and you're not maybe entirely at home there, and, um, you know, your family was on the run, maybe it's, maybe it's in your blood, maybe it's in all of our bloods, but do you find that, or do you feel... Um, that you are at home here and at home there? Um, I think I'm lucky in that I feel at home in both places, but I am um, increasingly, as time goes on, I think, you no, know, I'm, I'm an American too. This is my, this is my home. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I feel very at home in, in Israel as well. Um, I did grow up, you know, again, my, my grandfather, I talk a lot about him, obviously, he was very influential in my life. Um, but he would talk, he wanted, he was a, a doctor, and he would encourage his grandchildren to become doctors, not just for the usual reasons that uh, people tell their children to, you know, to do that, but because he said, you know, when you need to run, when, not if, um, it is something that you can do in any country. It's not bound to a language. And I was very nervous about becoming a writer. This is back, you know, I was thinking about this as a kid. It was pre-internet pre days before you could sort of assume that English would be spoken kind of everywhere. And I thought, wow, if I become a writer, then I'm tied to one language. And what happens if I need to run to another country? That, that anticipation of, of having to run was a part of my growing up until I sort of, I think maybe even until I got to college and I settled into my more adult life. I, what you just said reminded me of this um, very darkly funny moment uh, that I had with my sister a few years ago when you, when you said that your grandfather said, you know, when you need to run, mm -hmm. this is what, you know, you'll have to do as opposed to, you know, if, God forbid, you know, this should ever happen. Mm -hmm. So um, we had bought this home and uh, we found out that there was like a trap door that we didn't know about when we bought the home. And you could like, 
open up the trap door and go down these stairs. And the contractor, we were talking to the contractor about, you know, how we could make it so that you could open the trap door and get down the stairs. And then I made a dark joke and I said, when the anti-Semites come, this is where we can go and hide. And no one really laughed because it was dark and sort of <laughs> disturbing. And, uh, and then like a week later, I was on the phone, FaceTime with my sister and I was showing her, I was like, I want you to see the house we bought. And I was showing her the thing. And I said, and check it out. There's a trap door. And she goes, that's where you can hide when the anti-Semites come. So, <laughs> so I was like, um, what happened in our childhood? <laughs> like what lesson did our parents or grandparents share with us that we've now forgotten that that's part of our, that's in us. Yeah. Um, you know, if your grandfather had never said that to you, do you think you still would have somehow assimilated that truth? I think so. I'll tell you, I remember, look, I, I don't know what's the best way we should teach children about these things. I've struggled with it with my own kids. And uh, I basically just let them ask their questions of my great aunt Lily, who's still around in her 90s, and she escaped. Uh, she was 16 when the war started, and I let them hear very pretty gentle stories from her. Um, but when I was a kid, I went to a, a Jewish day camp, summer camp, and they had a Holocaust Memorial Day that they did for the kids in the summer, and they had us play. It was like a version of Capture the Flag, yeah. except we were hiding from the Nazis, and we had to hide under the, the cabins, under the bunks. I remember being terrified. And so I, I know they don't do that to kids anymore, but on the other hand, I sort of feel like, okay, well, you shouldn't terrify them. And then I think, what am I saying? So we should, so the Holocaust shouldn't be terrifying. So it's, you know, it's very hard to know where in our psyches we should hold it, how to be just frightened enough so that we are self-protective and so we're always vigilant that this shouldn't happen to anyone, any other group, and how to not be overly frightened. I don't know where the, if there is any human sweet spot in there. You let me know what you figure it out. You yeah. No, I think it's an incredible challenge for parents. It's, in, it's a challenge for educators and certainly for clergy. Um, you know, when, when you have the opportunity to speak to a congregation and you want to find the right balance between, you know, I want to talk about anti-Semitism so people can understand that it is alive and well, um, um, tragically. Um, and, but if that's all I ever talk about, am I sending the message that we should be fearful at every moment? Can we ever feel a sense of um, security and home? And is America truly different? I mean, part of the reason maybe Marissa says what she says about Americans, our sugar rush, is that there's philo-Semitism that we experience here that is unlike anything we've ever experienced before. You know, like, they, they like us. They really, really like us. And, um, <laughs> except not all of them, you know, and not all of the time. Um, but when you think about sort of how you deal with, um, you know, vulnerable characters and vulnerable people, certainly having a, a, a book like this featuring Esther um, in a moment where you started writing this about 15 years ago now, um, but to have it published in the midst of an incredible conversation in the United States um, in, with you know, the, the Me Too movement, um, the Academy Award nominated film, The Wife, which we were discussing earlier, which deals with some of the similar themes that you have in here. Um, how, do you, uh, you know, how, do you, how do you explain that? Is it just that, you know, your own experience? Is it that um, these, are, these are ideas that we're, that we're struggling with right now? Um, but it, the timing is, is pretty amazing. Uh, yes, I mean, I think, you know, somebody said, well, clearly you wrote this in anticipation of the Me Too movement. <laughs> I planned this 13 years ago, yeah. 14 years ago when I started this, right? Um, these issues have been around forever. Sometimes they get more attention, sometimes they don't. The, the fact that women have had to um, disguise their voices in order to be heard is very, very old. Uh, and and um, so some of the music that we thought was written by Felix Mendelssohn was actually written by his sister Fanny, but published under his name because it was felt that she couldn't get it heard and respected as a woman. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of women out there who've written under men's names over the years. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I, I think, you know, people have said to me, well, obviously there was no one, there was no Esther Velasquez, no one did this. And I think, well, yeah, Esther Velasquez was fictitious, 
But I was very careful and meticulous with my research because I wanted to take seriously the notion that this is the real history and a woman very well could have done this and could have had her place in this. There's a quote from um, Hilary Mantel who wrote the Wolf Hall novels that um, history, the historical record is what's left in the sieve after the centuries have run through it. Hmm. Well, so what gets caught in the sieve? What's caught in the sieve is what's kept in the public record. Whose lives are considered important enough to record? Well, over the centuries, it was white Christian men, wealthy, usually. Um, so everybody else's life runs through the sieve. And so we can't retrieve those stories. They're lost, but we can guess at them. We can intuit. We can see. And sometimes we can pick up actual things that were written under fake names or, or that were hidden. Um, and I think just because this is 2019 doesn't mean we've now officially found everything that was ever written under a, a man's name but was really by a woman. I think that there could have been someone who did something like this. So for me, it's a st those are themes that have been around, and, and I'm grateful that, you know, for, for the, the bigger you know, societal reason that we're talking about these things more. And, um, or stories like uh, you, know, you were saying, the wife where um, the woman actually has done the writing and someone else gets the credit. But these are very old stories, I think. At one point in the book, um, Helen uh, says to Aaron, uh, her, her assistant, uh, never underestimate the passion of a lonely mind. Never underestimate the passion of a lonely mind. How, as a writer, do you relate to that comment, which you wrote? But um, how does it, uh, how does it, how does it describe the the writer, gen, you know, generally? Yeah, I did say that, didn't I? Um, well, I think it is impossible to be a writer without um, without a fair bit of isolation and loneliness. Maybe there are ways to do it. Maybe if I were doing a different form of writing, sitting in a writer's room with other people, you know, that would be different. But to be a novelist, uh, John Gardner said that being a novelist is like sailing around the world alone. Uh, for a big part of the work, it has to be like that. And especially if you have something that's a really long draft and you don't want to spoil your first readers by giving them something that's incoherent, you want to save their first reaction for when you've got something that you've drafted and you think is as good as you can get it, and then you show it, and then you say, what do you think of this? So that's a lot of years when you're just working um, sort of in solitary, and you have to like that. So I'm a bit of an introvert, so that's okay. But it's, um, it's, a, long, it's a long period of time with a lot of stubbornness, especially, you know, for me, I was also, you know, balancing life with young kids, and there were a lot of interruptions, and there were a lot of snow days and ear infections and vomit. There was a lot of vomit. Um, and uh, a lot of time when you think, you know, how am I ever going to come back to this, and do I remember what this book is about? And um, so it's a lot of stubborn determination. And actually, um, I'll tell a story on my son. When he was, so I started this when I was pregnant with him. When people ask how long the book take, took, I love it when he's, if he's ever in the audience, I'll just sort of nod to him and he'll stand up and be like, me, I know how long it took. So he's 13 now. Um, and um, so they grew up watching me do this. And I, when he was, I don't know, maybe, maybe he was seven years old, I had just put together a first draft, a first full draft of the book. No one had seen it yet. And I was about to go away for a few days, which was a real rarity for me to go away, and I spent a few days working intensely to get it in the final shape to show it to my first readers. And I was packing. And um, he came into the room, and he found me crying, which he wasn't used to seeing. I said, Mom, what's wrong? And I said, well, I, I've been working on this book for seven years, and I suddenly thought, what if it's no good? And he, he said, Mom, even if every word is vomit, it will still be good with me. <laughs> it is done. And then I came back from working nonstop for several days. I came back in a big hug, big embrace, and then he disappears. He goes upstairs and he comes back. He's holding my hairbrush. He goes, because it looks like maybe you didn't get to use this for a few days. <laughs> so anyway, my kids were staunch and then, you know, but it was there is that um, that isolation and that fear. I think, you know, you've got some wonderful quotes on the back, Carol Gilligan. I think you should have included that one from your son. That Even would have if been, every word is uh, vomit, it will yeah, stick. <laughs> I think that would be good. Um, so nice we talked about this a little bit earlier. So this is a work of historical fiction. So already there's something interesting because you had talked about, you know, it's all a pack of lies, but it's not all a pack of lies. There are figures in here that are 
historical figures and things that they wrote are, are real. They're, they're not alternative facts. They're like real facts. Um, and then there are things that, that, that you just made up and that um, could have happened. There's nothing in here that, that we would come across that you know, defies um, the laws of nature or things like that. Like everything could have happened. Um, and yet when we talked about this earlier, you talked about how you don't outline and you don't really know where the book's going. You know you want it to have drama and a plot and then you want to kind of play with it and see where the characters take you. And I just think that's so fascinating that it's a work of fiction that you created and yet you're not really in control of it ever. How does that work? Is that um, like a dibbick or something like that that's writing through you? No, you know, I think... Um, I sometimes have wished that I were a kind of writer who could outline. I think that would be much more sensible. Uh, but maybe I would also be really bored because I knew what was going to happen. When I write, you know, I really have no idea. Um, or I have some ideas, but I'm not sure they're going to work out. But for me, it, it's, um, I have a very strong feeling about what plot is and where it comes from. And uh, the way I think of it, it's like an equation. Character, people, plus pressure equals plot. You take people, you put them under pressure, and they do things, and the things they do under pressure, in response to the pressure, that's the plot. If I don't know, first I have to know who my people are, because I have to know how they would react to pressure. And when I, when I teach, and I talk about plot and example, I sometimes use this Hamlet, because you can usually assume most people have a vague sense of the plot. Um, so, you know, imagine um, you're, so you're the Prince of Denmark, your uncle has just killed your mother, your father and married your mother, right? It, you know, it happens. And um, you're out on the battlements in the middle of the night. It's Act 1, Scene 3. The ghost of your father comes and says, you must avenge my most foul and unnatural murder. Right? That's a pressure. What are you going to do? And there are, I don't know, how many people you think are in this room? I, I'm terrible at estimating numbers. The rabbinic count, this is like 5,200 people, something like that. 52. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Yeah. So the, there are 5,200 of us. 5,300, something. And that means that we're going to have 5,200 different responses. Oh, wait, Jews. 50,000 <laughs> different responses, right? Um, and um, so if you're Hamlet, well, Hamlet, because he's the kind of personality he is, he's going to vacillate. He doesn't know whether he wants to take up arms against the Sea of Troubles. He doesn't know, you know, what he's going to do, so he's going to, first he's going to drive his girlfriend, you know, literally crazy for a while, he's going to put on a fake play. Because he vacillates and responds the way he does, you've got the plot that you have, and you have a pile of bodies on the stage at the end, and it is the tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. If you substituted in a different character, Fortinbras, different character, same play, you must avenge my most foul and unnatural murderer, he would just pick up a sword, because that's who Fortinbras is. So you've got to think who your characters are and what pressures they're under. Helen is, has certain pressures in her life. She has a department chair she can't stand. She's going into forced uh, retirement um, uh, because it happens at a certain age in England. She has a hand tremor, and she can't touch these documents, and she's got to re rely on this arrogant American 20-something grad student, Aaron Levy, who she doesn't like to turn pages for her. Those are pressures. How's she going to react? Aaron comes to the UK thinking he's going to be an academic star. He's totally failing and in free fall at his dissertation. That's a pressure. What's he going to do? And get these two in a room together, and it's, you know, are they going to fight? And, and so the plot comes from there. So I follow my characters, and I might have an idea of what I want them to do, but that doesn't matter, because if I force that... Have you ever been reading a novel, and a character does something, and you get indignant on behalf of the character? You think, they would not do that. The author's just doing that to make a good you know, plot twist. I don't know, maybe you guys don't get that way, but I get, <laughs> I get very indignant. Um, and so I have to see what the characters would actually do. And if they wouldn't do something, then I can't do that thing. I can't make them do that thing. So I'm following them. I'm writing... It's an experience I've had many times in my life. I'm writing like a short person in a crowded room. I can't see everything that's in the room. I can see a plate of food. I can see the face of the person I'm talking to. I can see someone's shoulder. And I've got to follow. I've got to find my way around the whole room before I know what the whole picture is. And that's how I'm writing. So I do a draft. Maybe partway through, I think, oh, maybe this is how the papers got there. Maybe this is how the papers got into that stairwell. I'm not sure. Let's see. Um, and a lot of things, you know, you would be surprised how far I was into the book before I figured out kind of major plot elements. And then I have to go back and tidy it all up and make it look like I did it on purpose. Yeah. 
Well, we can't thank you enough for being here with us. I wanted to read one last passage um, that I found so beautiful and moving. Um, it's a description of, um, of a relationship between one of the characters and, and this rabbi. Um, and here's how it's described. It was the highest love she was capable of, respect. Yet respect also demanded that when the very tools of logic that he'd given her argued against his beloved tradition, she must follow them toward conclusions he'd abhor. The greatest act of love, indeed the only religion she could comprehend, was to speak the truth about the world. Love must be then an act of truth-telling, a bearing of mind and spirit just as ardent as the bearing of the body. Truth and passion were one, and each impossible without the other. Rachel, thank you for your passion, and thank you for sharing your truth with us. Thank, thank you. you so much.